The 19th century was a period of dynamism and innovation, and many people did not hesitate to note the changes in manufacturing and economic growth taking place throughout the century. Writers were quick to rhapsodize on the unimaginable wonders that industrialization and mechanized production brought. As one French writer noted, our revolutions are no longer made by men like John Locke or Rousseau, but rather inventors like James Watt and Richard Ackwright. By the middle of the century, French critics began speaking about an industrial revolution that was profoundly changing European society. And soon enough, British critics like Arnold Toynbee also began using this phrase, making it a commonplace familiar among all Europeans. In 1851, Britain showed the extent of its industrial prowess to the world with the staging of the so-called Great Exhibition in London. This expo was intended to provide an opportunity to showcase the technological and industrial inventions of the West. Countries were invited to exhibit their technological marvels and inventions to an international audience and medals were awarded for the best inventions. A large steel and glass exhibition hall was erected in Hyde Park, fittingly named the Crystal Palace by one magazine writer of the day. Six million people in total flocked to London to visit the expo, hailing it as a modern marvel of the industrial world. At the Great Exhibition, Britain, Europe, and the United States dramatically showed off its dynamism and achievements to everyone in attendance. The exhibition halls were intended to serve as a testament to Europe's innovative spirit, its triumphs, and its own sense of unbridled superiority. And to those who attended, it did not disappoint. These types of exhibitions and professions of faith in science and innovation gave the 19th century a certain character, one linked to the idea of progress. A widespread perception existed that things were moving forward, that society and man, guided by science and industry, were, on the whole, improving. Not all agreed with this optimistic appraisal, however. Some critics remained skeptical of what industry, mechanization, and scientific progress held for the future. There was, after all, a dark side to the modernizing process, one that would become evident as the years went on. Writing in 1844, the social theorist and journalist Friedrich Engels gave a rather bleak picture of England in the 19th century. He noted filthy streets lined with ramshackled houses, canals filled with brown water, and dreary mills where inhabitants worked. Everything which here arouses horror and indignation is of recent origin and belongs to the industrial epoch, he remarked bluntly. A stroll through Paris at this time was hardly different. In 1852, the literary critic Théophile Gautier was horrified by what he found in the city, writing, Three quarters of the streets are only networks of black and fetid filth, as in the times of the starkest barbarism. No traces of art or elegance. Boxes of plaster with squares cut into them constitute what one calls a house in the 19th century, in this city that claims to be a modern Athens, the queen of civilization. Modernity's dark side was clear to critics and writers of the day, and this dark side was evident in the immense social changes and dislocations wrought by industrialization. The cottage industries, which had once employed artisans and craft workers, were hit the hardest by these changes. Artisans and independent tradesmen, once protected by worker guilds, now found themselves at the mercy of business owners as industrial production moved into newly built mills and factories. 
since most factory work did not require skilled labor. Craftsmen were now forced to compete with peasant laborers, who, facing shortages of land in the countryside, migrated to cities in search of work. This new competitive atmosphere entailed that factory wages were significantly lowered. As a result, laborers experienced a general decline in the standard of living. Factory work also had an anonymous identity. The individuality that many craft workers had prided themselves on in the past was erased as a poor urban working class came into existence, creating what theorists would soon refer to as the proletariat. The life of a 19th century worker was tough. Long days, typically 14 to 16 hours, in unsanitary conditions could be expected. Social insurance or sick leave was non-existent, meaning if a worker became sick or was injured on the job, they did not get paid. Workers rarely made enough to purchase their own homes. As renters with precarious incomes, they frequently moved from place to place, sometimes taking a room for a night in a boarding house. Poverty also compelled communal living in many cases, with entire families occupying rooms or banding together with other families. Given this peripatetic lifestyle, workers had very few possessions. It was a stark and grueling life in many respects, with few comforts or sense of home. Yet if industrialization created an impoverished urban class, it equally brought into existence a new class of industrial elites. This class possessed the wealth, profits, and knowledge to invest in industry, and it was primarily these types of entrepreneurs and capitalists who would open up new factories and purchase the machines necessary for mechanized production. While the revolutionary movements of the 18th century had challenged the ingrained social hierarchies and feudal orders, this hardly meant that social divisions no longer existed. Absolutism had maintained the idea of social orders that were considered natural and immutable. The French Revolution had rejected this logic. But in tearing down the old feudal order came a new concept, class. Unlike orders, class was mobile. One could move up or down depending on their wealth and social status. This idea was favorable to merchants and those with non noble backgrounds since it opened up new opportunities for advancement. Class, in other words, was the basis for an open aristocracy promoted by liberals like Guizot. The changes brought by the emergence of new social classes tore at the social fabric of European society. As the urban poor found its standards of living in decline, those involved in business and trade were coming to enjoy a more comfortable lifestyle. These conditions set the stage for a new type of social conflict that would become increasingly remarked upon throughout the 19th century, class conflict. If ideas like liberalism had spread among the emerging classes of capitalists and non-noble elites, Workers quickly adopted new ideas of their own that reflected their specific situation and interests. Socialism became a predominant rallying call among working class leaders and organizers, reflecting a movement and ideology that sought to address the situation of labor in an industrial age. One of the fundamental ideas behind socialism was equality, and in this respect, it was a product of the French Revolution. Thinkers like Saint-Just and Gracchus Babeuf had spoken out openly about the need to ensure social equality in a truly democratic society. Socialism continued this line of egalitarian thought, encouraging calls for the redistribution of wealth and property among citizens. For those who held property or disagreed with the revolution, 
These ideas were seen as a threat. As such, authority took a strong stance on ensuring that worker radicalism was kept in check. During the Napoleonic Wars, protests in Britain revealed that these ideas had spread across the Channel, as frustrated workers and activists vehemently denounced the monarchy in the name of social equality. Under the circumstances, this stance was tantamount to supporting Napoleon, and was therefore deemed treasonous. Socialism was branded a dangerous French idea, one that intended nothing less than the complete destruction of British society. Although the Allies may have defeated Napoleon, victory did not mean that these new ideas were extinguished. The end of the Napoleonic Wars brought an economic downturn that impacted workers and fueled more radical positions. In August of 1819, reform-minded organizers called a public assembly in Manchester, one of the leading cities at the heart of Britain's industrial development. Gathering in the square of St. Peter's Field, nearly 80,000 people attended to voice their grievances. When the police were called in to disperse the protesters, a riot ensued, resulting in arrests and acts of police brutality. In the papers, the left branded the event the Peterloo Massacre, but this hardly deterred the state from clamping down on worker militancy. In the wake of Peterloo, the government passed the Six Acts, which curbed freedom of speech and assembly throughout the country. Public gatherings now required the approval of the county sheriffs in advance to prevent rowdy mobs from reaping havoc. Under the new laws, newspaper editors were required to post a bond in order to publish their journals. If a paper was found publishing articles favorable to socialism or radical ideas, the caution money put up would be forfeited and the paper shut down. In this way, the British government hoped to strike a blow to the worker protests that were disrupting society in the name of political and social reform. This state of affairs could not, however, be maintained indefinitely. Forward-looking thinkers felt that a response to worker protest was necessary, but they also believed that suppression and state surveillance were not a productive solution. The Parliamentary Reform Bill passed in 1832 had given more political power to the middle classes, and it was precisely the newly enfranchised middle that was advising a new approach to the social question. Following political reform in 1832, other bills quickly followed, committed to social reform. A series of factory acts were passed, intending to deal with the problems faced by industrialized labor. Restrictions were placed on child and female labor in mines and factories, while working hours and working conditions were subject to regulation. These acts were to serve as a response to the abominable working and living conditions that industrialization produced. After 1815, the need for housing led contractors to cut corners on buildings bringing into existence slums and neighborhoods which exposed the misery faced by workers living in poor conditions. In some cases, building was done so quickly that little attention was paid to necessities like water, adequate light, and plumbing, and it was not unheard of that sewage lines occasionally got mixed up with those carrying drinking water. Reformers felt it was imperative to address the needs of the growing populations in urban industrial centers and to improve the living conditions of the working classes. To this end, a poor law was introduced in 1834. This act authorized the creation of workhouses intended to give jobs to the unemployed. While these provisions were supposed to solve the problem of poverty in the country, in reality, the jobs created by the government were typically the worst kinds of work imaginable, and paid wages were lower than what average industries usually paid. The living accommodations provided in these workhouses were usually deplorable 
with no light and heat offered in the small rooms provided to destitute workers. Men and women were split up and lived in different houses to discourage procreation. These measures, the government believed, would over time reduce the population of the poor in Britain. Moreover, the horrendous living conditions experienced in these workhouses were intentional. They were intended to encourage the poor to work hard so that they might climb out of their poverty and join the ranks of productive society. These reforms drew strong opposition from working class leaders who criticized the half-hearted efforts. Reformers were not helping the working class, they claimed, but trying to soothe social tensions in the country for the benefit of the middle classes. The capitalists and middle classes were not allies of the workers, and given the chance, would betray them for their own interests. Given this line of thought, working class leaders began to organize on their own behalf, and one of the movements that became most popular in Great Britain was the Chartist movement. Composed of reformers and artisans, the Chartists worked to gain the support of unions and organized mass demonstrations and rallies to make known workers' social grievances. In addition to organizing demonstrations, they also collected signatures on petitions, which would then be submitted to Parliament to have their voice heard before the government. As the Chartists made evident when they submitted these petitions, the number of signatures always outnumbered those who were able to vote in the country, indicating that these signatories, more than the Parliament, represented the true voice of British society. Leading the Chartists was the Irishman and militant Fergus O'Connor. A journalist and organizer, O'Connor went to great lengths to build coalitions among trade groups in England, Wales, and Scotland, making tours of the country in the hopes of building a truly national movement. In the mid-1840s, O'Connor successfully circulated a petition which boasted more than three million signatures on behalf of the workers. Yet despite having so many signatures, Parliament refused to consider the bill. In 1847, as an economic downturn seized Britain, O'Connor set out to capitalize on the skyrocketing unemployment. As before, he went about collecting signatures on another petition to press worker grievances on Parliament. This latest petition obtained an astronomically high number of signatures, and when Parliament saw the number of signatures, they submitted it to further investigation. As they went over the names, politicians quickly realized that O'Connor had forged many of the signatures. One popular anecdote insisted he had been so careless as to actually forge Queen Victoria's signature on the petition. Once Parliament learned of this dishonesty, they accused O'Connor of fraud. O'Connor and the Chartist movement were discredited and support slowly dwindled for the cause. The workers had, in this respect, become the victims of their own leaders. O'Connor himself took to drinking and brawling in the coming years. His reputation as a tough-minded activist diminished. In the mid-1850s, the former hero of the working classes suffered a complete mental breakdown and was committed temporarily to an asylum. In 1855, he died penniless and mad abandoned by those who had once followed him. Despite this less than heroic end, what the Chartists and worker agitation in general indicated was telling. The nature of work and productivity had changed radically in the 19th century. And with these changes came new classes and a host of new social problems. Governments were compelled to deal with these problems lest they find themselves facing a worker revolution. These 
general questions of how to solve the problems generated by industrialization and how to alleviate the poverty and misery experienced by the working classes became broadly referred to as the social question in the 19th century. And it would be a question that governments, middle class reformers, politicians and workers would all attempt to answer in their own ways. Socialism, as both a social and political philosophy, was a French idea in its origins. It stemmed from the radicalism and egalitarianism of the French Revolution. But it was the atmosphere of the 1830s and 40s in which socialism became a movement in its own right. Moreover, the years of the July Monarchy, a self-proclaimed bourgeois government, provided an environment in which new ideas of social relations and political conflict found fertile ground in France. French industrialization did not proceed as rapidly as British industrialization. Nonetheless, during the 1830s, the French economy was being modernized, thanks in part to the incentives offered by Louis Philippe's government. Just as in England, traditional French artisans found themselves under threat by the new trends in manufacturing and the concentration of capital in the hands of a small group of financiers and entrepreneurs. Given the political temperament and radicalism of Parisian activists, middle-class observers did not hesitate to peg workers as an ever-present danger to order. As one newspaper warned in 1832, there is a class of men whose lack of education and precarious lifestyle places them in a state of dangerous hostility to society. With the boom occurring during the 1830s, French entrepreneurs and bankers saw a golden age of opportunity. They began investing in industrial ventures and railroads, primarily using credit to finance their projects. Yet when the economy took a sudden downturn in the 1840s, French finances were thrown into a state of crisis. When lenders began calling in their loans, French industrialists were unable to pay. To cut costs, employers began downsizing their productivity, which inevitably meant cutting jobs and incurring the resentment of workers. Faced with this situation, it was evident that Louis Philippe and Guizot's values reflected the bourgeoisie and not the interests of the workers, who had no voting rights. Guizot's admonishment of get rich had always appeared callous, but it appeared even more insensitive in an economic climate where jobs were hard to come by and workers faced poverty on a daily basis. Worker militancy had its own unique tradition in France, one largely inspired by radical republicanism and the sans of the revolutionary period. Jacobinism had never lost its appeal for the far left in France, and it was the radical conspirator Louis-Auguste Blanqui who best carried on this Jacobin tradition. Blanqui was a revolutionary adventurer deeply dedicated to republican values and the French Revolution. Due to his political activities, he would spend over half his life in jail, earning him the nickname L'Enfermé, or the Imprisoned One. Like his Jacobin predecessors, his revolutionary ideas stressed violent struggle and political terror in the quest for equality. Guns and bread, as he put it, were what the workers needed to free themselves from a capitalist system which he equated to a modern form of feudalism. In Blanqui's estimation, true equality would only be achieved by a revolutionary state committed to socialist policies and the people. In this, he looked back to the days of the Jacobin Republic as a model, venerating the men of blood, as he called them. This militant brand of Republican socialism was a minority opinion, however. In fact, more moderate thinkers saw little in this style of revolutionary adventurism. 
Others did not see capitalism and industrialization as inherently evil. Socialist writers, like Charles Fourier, even idealized industrial society in certain ways, believing that relations between capitalists and workers did not have to be antagonistic. As he saw it, industry did not need to progress at the expense of exploiting the working classes, and could benefit everyone. To this end, Fourier urged workers to set up self-run communes, imagining small communities which grew their own food, produced their own goods, and distributed the wealth of the community equally. Fourier's ideas were not necessarily unique. Moreover, they were part of a broader intellectual trend in the post-revolutionary period that believed that solving the social question not only entailed poor relief, it required new forms of social organization altogether. Chief among these socialist idealists was the philosopher Henri de Saint-Simon. Although hailing from an aristocratic family, Saint-Simon was hardly a typical aristocrat. He not only claimed to be descended from Charlemagne, which was probably not true, but he also claimed that his illustrious forebearer appeared to him in dreams, telling him he was destined for great things. Despite his social pedigree, Saint-Simon despised lazy and self-interested aristocrats who contributed nothing to society. For Saint-Simon, work was the important thing, and not just any type of work either. Industry, technology, and scientific endeavors, these were the types of work that modern society required. Saint-Simon had a distinct vision of society and what it ought to be, namely, a truly organized machine. And yet, this is not what he saw around him. Everywhere he looked, industry was inviting chaos. It was generating conflicts between employers and workers. There existed little coordination between the economy and the government. For Saint-Simon, an industrial economy required organization and maintenance. It had to run effectively like a machine. In order for this to occur, the state had to abandon a laissez-faire approach and get involved in managing it, and not just supervise it either, but actually oversee and take charge of all society's productive forces. In this respect, the state would take a direct role in stimulating industries, running the economy, and negotiating with workers. It would create complete harmony between industrialists and the working classes, between the rich and the poor, and it would ensure that all ran smoothly. This type of state could not be run by a king or parliament, he believed. Only those capable of understanding the complexities of an industrial economy, of mobilizing resources and applying scientific knowledge to practical problems were fit to rule. A technocratic elite that would promote progress, develop industries, and work to organize society along rational and efficient lines. Saint-Simonianism was an attractive philosophy to many intellectuals during the 19th century and the movement found a great number of adherents, both in France and internationally. Its appeal was in its vision of a progressive and modern industrial society, one that was free of conflict. Its emphasis on social management spoke to both the principles of the Enlightenment as well as the utopianism bred from the years of the French Revolution. However, its authoritarian and even anti-democratic basis did not necessarily sit well with Republicans and Democrats. This would be especially true of the social Republican Louis Blanc. Although rejecting the radicalism of men like Blanqui, Blanc did support solid Republican ideas of popular sovereignty and the will of the people. In fact, rights were central to his political philosophy. Men had natural rights, 
but they also had a right to work, he argued. Without this right, all other freedoms were pointless. An individual had to be economically independent in order to exercise their freedoms. In a modern wage labor society, the right to life was dependent upon the ability to support oneself. Without an income, a person could not live, and this entailed that employment was a right that should be guaranteed, just like the right to free speech or political expression. Blanc's socialism looked back to the democratic traditions of French republicanism. It eschewed political violence, but insisted that the state had an obligation to its citizens to create a moral and just society that could accommodate workers in the modern age. Taken together, these diverse opinions revealed that during the 1840s, French society was divided politically and socially. Political thinkers looked back to the revolution, but they were also rethinking and reinterpreting its principles in line with the changes wrought by modernization. Yet despite this diversity, one thing was evident. Growing tensions between workers and employers, between liberal politicians and republicans, and between reformers and revolutionaries, exposed the political fault lines running through French society since 1789. And in the proper circumstances, these divisions had the potential to create an explosive situation. The French politician Alexis de Tocqueville was not being facetious when, taking note of the situation in January 1848, he warned, I believe we are at this moment sleeping on a volcano. The July monarchy, with its self-described bourgeois politic, had created an atmosphere of political conflict in which class was central. For the left, opposition became worker opposition, and the social question became linked to ideas of social equality that traced their origins back to the French Revolution and the principles for which it stood.